sister for That's probably good. So technically, we're not supposed to start till 150, but some groups started. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know what well, the camera guy's not here, so I'm not, I'll give him a couple minutes. <laughs> All I'm going to do is say the exact same thing I said in there. So it's okay, so um, I'm an East Coast guy. I'm sort of North Carolina. Okay. I went to the University of North Carolina. You're a basketball fan. You know, I'm a basketball fan. You lost a double lot of time to Virginia Tech in the last second shot last night. So, anyway, um, you lost a Clemson at home. I said, forget that, you lost a Clemson at home. Please, please help me. Okay, now I've got real forgiveness issues. So, um, so, went to Regent University, lived in Williamsburg, got married in Williamsburg, um, went to Regent University for film school, and then uh, while all my fellow film school grads stayed there and worked on the 700 Club, my wife said, why don't we go to L.A. where <laughs> things are actually happening? So we said, yeah, that's a good idea. So we moved out to L.A. and we both worked in Hollywood for several years. And, um, and then uh, started adopting kids, left the film industry, went into ministry, and then um, a few years ago, felt like, um, like we wanted to be a voice in a new area. Like we really helped mobilize the church in Southern California. Um, our church, but also the greater church in the area, and then also got them working with the county, which was um, unprecedented. Uh, DC churches in LA County working together, and so then we um, wanted to bring you know bring that voice to another area that might need it. Look, start looking around, look to Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia. Also wanted to be closer to family because my parents are still in Williamsburg, my mother-in-law's there, got a brother in Fredericksburg, and so then um, we. Uh, we ended up settling in Richmond because Virginia has more kids that age out of foster care. I'm going to talk about that. Um, more kids age out of foster care percentage-wise in Virginia than any other state pretty much every year. And so we felt like we could be a voice in Virginia. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Can you talk about how your parents um, felt about all the, all the options? My parents? Yeah. yeah uh, well, let, let's do it in, you know, like that. That would be the first question. So if I, if I call on anybody else, <laughs> then um, hit me with something. And because, I mean, my parents have been So we'll give it two more minutes. So where's everybody from? You're from Virginia. You're from where? I uh, lived in Richmond 15 years. I'm back up here in Fairfax. OK, what well, part of Richmond? I was in Southside, Woodland Heights, right off of Sons Avenue, Forest Hill. OK, yeah, yeah. We're Forest down Park. Uh, you, you know where Woodlake is? Right in the middle? Yes. Yeah, yes. we're down there. Near there. It's on the Fox State. Yes. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, their son, her son goes to her. Actually, we go to his church. Where's the neighbor in Richmond? It's, 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 it's actually um, Arthur Ashe Boulevard, which used to be Boulevard. Sure. And, and yeah. you know where the museum is? County Court of the Museum. Okay. It's at a, um, a synagogue. Take that. Take that. Yeah, take that. And you're yeah, that was a, it's part of the church plan. Yeah, and your yeah. was a uh, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, yeah. yeah. church uh, Christian, okay. yeah. Christian yeah. Jewish. Well, Are you a Christian? Yeah. 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 No, I'm a patriot. Yeah. 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 Jordan Worthy and Perkins. I was there in the glory days, right? And so I just dated myself. So anyway, <laughs> this is the first time I've ever said I can't wait till football season. <laughs> <laughs> no Tar Heel ever says that. That's like a Kentucky Wild Duke saying that. You know, you just don't do that. Right. So it's just anyway. And where are you from? I'm an adoptive father from Pittsburgh. Love that. Love that. How many? How many kids? One. Okay. From where? Talk to. <laughs> we could, well, she's, no, she's a local kid. Okay. From foster care? Uh, or was no. it private? Okay. So you got her at birth. Okay. What agency did you go through? It's called the Children's Home of Pittsburgh. Okay. Very cool. Thanks for doing what you did. I'm a grandfather of two Very cool. And where do they live? Vermont. And they were adopted where? Through the foster care system. That's awesome. Not many kids in foster care. I won't mention the pit people here. <coughs> the pit people. I know, by 14? Yeah, yeah that's crazy. 66, 52, I believe, was this one. <laughs> but I'm not counting. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 and where are y'all from? Are 
Are you together? I'm, yeah, I'm, we're, from Northern, we're from Northern Virginia. Okay. Um, I'm about to move to Georgia to work with the pro-life movement in Georgia. Okay. So, and we're adoption in and foster care will be part of what I'm working on. I love that. Where in Georgia? Atlanta. Okay. The whole state. So do you know, um, can you know the uh, folks from um, Sandra Stanley and like Andy Stanley's church, they've got a huge foster care and adoption ministry down there. Really? There's actually some really good foster care and adoption ministries down in Georgia. And if you want to connect with them, get my card afterwards and I'll connect you with us. Because Andy Cook Fabulous. with Project Cloud, Promise 686 is down there. And are you part of an Anglican church? I will be. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so, okay, do you know Bishop Gertzi? Mm -hmm. Okay, so his son mm -hmm. is at a church outside of Atlanta. And they have a new foster care and adoption ministry. Oh. Michael Currency, so I can connect you with you. What's it called? Logan I think it is Logan Bill, yeah. And how about you? Uh, so I live right in the corner, actually. Here so you just church. drifted in because you were called? I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like a little bit that But I go to National Community Church here okay. in the DC area. But I'm here at Supporting Chain. Very cool. And how about y'all? We're from Fairfax City. Okay. Go to True. Okay. And we have an adopted daughter that we got it three weeks from the Lutheran Social Services. Where was that? In Washington, D.C. Okay. And uh, she's now 35. That's right. That's right. She, she doesn't have children. She has animals. Okay. But well, she, she and her husband were in the foster care program for Shenandoah <laughs> County, uh, Virginia, this, the last year where they had uh, three emergency cases. And, all teenage girls, the first two turned out. 17. Uh, 15, 16, 17, some of that age group. The first two emergencies turned out fine. The last one was a dis disaster. It's like they're discouraged. Uh, they're taking a break, but I think they'll go back to foster. Well, I would love to talk to them because it, it is discouraging at times. I mean, we, we've had several moments in our journey where we just said, why are we doing this? You know? <laughs> and, um, and yet, you know, just felt like God called us to get back in there. And so I mean we, we gave up on the system after our first two and, and God reminded us that He didn't bring us through that just so that we could adopt a couple of kids, but He brought us through that so that we could be a voice for others. So I'd love to talk to them if they are feeling discouraged. <laughs> and and connect them with others in their area. Where in the Shenandoah area are they? Mount Jackson. Mm -hmm. So what's that near? It's Air. near Woodstock. Okay, how close is it to Winchester? Oh, it's, it's not far. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So there's a great um, coalition of foster care and adoption ministries in the in the Winchester area. Um, there, there are about ten of these, and that's one of the things I've been doing in Virginia is helping set up local networks across the state of uh, people involved in foster care and adoption ministry through churches and parachurch ministries and agencies. And so there's a really good, strong one that started about a year ago in the Winchester area. If they wanted to get together with them and just you know, have extra, you know, that extra support. Yeah. To know that you're not yeah. alone in this right. is huge. It's interesting, interesting. Winchester's in a different county than Shenandoah right. County or whatever. So they have such strict rules there that sure. whenever they would take a foster child across county lines, they had to have an approval mm -hmm. from the social workers to say, hey, you want to go or to Costco right. and whatever to buy something mm -hmm. and uh, can't, you know. Yeah. And they wonder why these kids have, you know, struggles in life. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, I'm originally from Russia. Okay. And I mean, I was thinking Alabama with that accent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, accents. I worked with the orphan kids uh, with American missionaries back in the 90s. Okay. In in Saint Petersburg, Russia, and that started uh, just cast dear to my heart. So I am kind of in a career transition, uh, thinking where I should be involved in right. this. This is just very dear to my heart, so I am not, you know, I have not adopted or, but the cause is dear to my heart, so I'm getting to know uh, Ned Fines, are dear friends of mine here at the church, uh, Jen Memphis, uh, you know them. Jen I'm is sure. one of my favorite people in the yes, entire world. Yes, I yes, I love them. I'm yes. not one of his, though. He just does uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I am I'm learning, uh, you know, about generally what is being done, you know, I don't know. Maybe they will be work from my hands. We shall see. Well, why don't, why don't you come to uh, the KFO Summit this year? Talk to Jen I, about that. It's you know, Dallas I did come last year. There. You did? And, okay. Yes. And so I probably will go this year. I went to work with health orphans as well. With? World Without oh, Orphans okay. yeah, in yeah. Uh, Thailand. So do you know Hope for Orphans? Hope for Orphans actually started KFO. And that and is in Atlanta? No, they're based, in, well, they were based in Little Rock, and now they're based in Texas. 
No, I don't know them. Yeah. So they actually started KFO. I was on staff with them when Jed got hired to be president of KFO. And yeah, I mean, I've been a fan of his ever since. He's just a phenomenal guy. So yeah, you got to go to this church. Yeah. Yeah. He found out I was going to be here and he said I'm staying away. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm kind of bitter about that. <laughs> no, he and I actually uh, did a breakout together at our Diocese Senate a few months ago, awesome. and that was a huge Incredible. blessing to be able to yeah. share with you. Sam, Sam, something. Comment about that. That was okay. really good. Okay, good. Gotcha. Jed was good. Yeah. yeah. John told the same story. Mm -hmm. Hi, Roger. So, um, <laughs> how about you? Hi, I'm from this area right now. Okay. I've lived here a long time. I'm not married. I have no children. Do I? I don't have anybody I'm adopting or. Uh, fostering, but I know all these people that do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, that's huge because I mean, never a lot of times we feel isolated. You know, the, the fostering and adopted parents feel isolated, and sometimes we actually lose friends. I know people who've had to leave churches before, their families back off, and so they feel alone, and so the fact that you're there and you can support them is huge. I mean, we all need a support system, so, um, you know, just the fact that you know them is means a lot. It really and does. she works in a high school, so she has okay. lots so of kids. Yeah. Of kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about you? I live um, outside of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, northwest of Pittsburgh, um, recently from New Jersey. Um, I've always been interested in adoption. Um, we have three grown daughters of our own, but I have always had a passion for adoption. Um, I have our oldest daughter is aging, getting into her mid 30s, has a two year old, and um, has mental health issues, but is interested in um, adopting as well. So, um, interested in considering what that might mean for her, right. whether or not she could do that. Thanks for being Okay. Um, we are from South Carolina, Mount Pleasant. Near Charleston? Yes. Okay. Right across the bridge. Okay. Um, and we are, um, one of our sons, he and his wife, are in the adoption process. We're adopting from India. Okay. Through a Christian agency. What agency is it? Lifeline. Okay. Lifeline is phenomenal. They are absolutely Based in Alabama, by the way, so you admit it. American Greater Organization. Did you bring anything from Fast and French, some of their pate? No. Is that still there, Fast and French in Charleston? I haven't heard of it. Is Magnolia still there? Yes. 82 Queen? Okay, good. Two out of three, I'm good. Fast and French was this great little like sandwich and soup place. I went to, my wife took me to, what's the art festival? Spoleto. Do they still do that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we went to Spoleto one year. Oh. Um, oh, well, so, yeah, it's just a great city. Okay, we're going to go, it's close enough to 150. I don't know if the camera's on. I have no problem. Probably been on this whole time. Probably. Yeah. That's okay. Y'all are on. Okay, so we're, um, I mean, I, you know, I have notes. I'm just going to kind of go through them, and then I'll leave it for questions afterwards. And, um, I think there's a pretty healthy break in between, so we can, if anybody wants to talk afterwards, uh, that's fine. And I also want you to know that I'll, I'll continue to be a resource beyond this if you want. If you want to take my card and uh, talk about some of these issues um, beyond today, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I, I spoke at a conference in Southern California one time, an adoption foster care conference, and there was a couple from our church there, and they came up to me the next day and they said, John, we don't want to bother you, but can we talk to you about adoption? It's like, no, you don't understand, that's not bothering you. You know, if you want to talk about something else that's probably bothering me. But um, foster care and adoption, I will talk about anytime, anywhere. So uh, let me just double check the time we're supposed to end, and I'll make sure I'll leave plenty of time. Okay, so it's okay, so this officially ends at 2.35. It officially starts in one minute. <laughs> okay. All right. So as you heard in the main session, uh, if you were there, that God did build my family through adoption. We have seven children that the Lord blessed us with, and they all came from the Los Angeles County foster care system. We can have biological children. A lot of people wonder that, and it's kind of weird for me to tell. We're not infertile. You know, it's kind of a weird thing to say to people, but I don't want people to exclude themselves from adoption because they assume it's only for certain couples. Okay, so 
So let's just get that out there. Um, we just believe that this is the, the path that God had for us. Uh, there's so many blessings to being an adoptive family. Uh, there are a lot of hidden advantages that people don't realize. Um, actually, one of those came up recently when our 10-year-old came to me and she said, she asked that dreaded question, Dad, where do babies come from? And uh, I quickly I took a deep breath and prayed for the right words, and I said, well, babies come from social workers. And I got ice cream. And I don't think that was a cop. I think it was a legitimate answer. <laughs> so, uh, th this past Sunday, as you may well know, well know, was National Sanctity of Life Sunday. According to the Life Matters website, churches around the United States use the day to celebrate God's gift of life, commemorate many lives lost to abortion, and commit themselves to protecting life, human life at every stage. Sanctity of Life Sunday began in 1984, when then-President Reagan issued a pro proclamation that Sunday, January 22, 1984, would be National Sanctity of Human Life Day. In his proclamation, he wrote about the more than 15 million children who had lost their lives in legal abortions in the 11 years since Roe v. Wade had passed, saying that these children, over tenfold the number of Americans lost in all of our nation's wars, will never laugh, never sing, never experience the joy of human love. When you listen to the words from the initial proclamation of President Reagan, something jumps out at me. President Reagan said that the children who were aborted will never laugh, will never sing, and will never experience the joy of human love. In those words, a basic presumption is made that the children who are born into this world will live lives marked by laughter, marked by singing, and they'll experience the joy of human love. And it's a beautiful picture when you think about it. It's a picture that, that, that God has planted in us. That's, that's God's design. Now, generally speaking, when we think of sanctity of life, when we think of the pro-life movement within the church and its stand against abortion, we think of the, the pro-life movement within the church and its stand against abortion. And I think certainly if you talk to people outside the church, they would say that the sanctity of life or the pro-life movement, according to Christians, is all about protecting children in the womb. In fact, one of the criticisms of the pro-life movement is that we only care about children from conception to birth, and once children are born, we stop caring. Now, I've been in churches a long, long time, and I can tell you that there's nothing further from the truth, but that is the impression that many critics in our culture have gotten from us. More and more, thankfully, we are seeing that pro-life ministries are becoming aware of and addressing issues beyond birth, and this is a very good thing. We're starting to recognize that it isn't only about ensuring the right to life itself, but it's about people's quality of life as well. Oh, okay. I she was coming in. In which case, we would have started over. No, we wouldn't. <laughs> Anglicans for Life is a great example of this holistic pro-life approach, whether it's addressing not just abortion, but issues such as abstinence, adoption, euthanasia, and more. Going back to President Reagan's 1984 proclamation, he also said, we are poor, not simply for lives, lives not led and for contributions not made, but also for the erosion of our sense of, wor of the worth and dignity of every individual. To diminish the value of one category of human life is to diminish us all. When we look at the world today, it's easy to see that the lives of, of many people are diminished in our society today. Many people are marginalized in society. And where people are marginalized, the church needs to be there. Where people are sick, the church needs to be there. Where people are impoverished, the church needs to be there. Where people are oppressed, the church needs to be there. Where people are enslaved, the church needs to be there. Where people are hungry, the church needs to be there. Where people are homeless, the church needs to be there. Where people are trafficked, the church needs to be there. And where people are orphaned, the church needs to be there. These are all pro-life issues, and there are many more. The church, according to Matthew 25, not only needs to be there on these issues, but is expected by God to be there. Pro-life churches, pro-life ministries need to address all of human life, from conception to death, and we need to be concerned not only about preserving or saving lives, but about helping people live the lives that God created them to live. So what is this life that God created people to live? In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Another translation puts it this way, I have come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. One well-known Christian theologian wrote this about what this abundant life looks like. Particularly, you are saved from wolves and thieves that come to kill and destroy, saved from every enemy that would destroy you. Enter by me and you will be forever safe. But none of us wants to be merely safe. We are not created merely to be safe. The human heart wants infinitely more than safety. Oh yes, safety is basic and necessary. We want to be protected from what can destroy us. We want life, but we want more than mere life. We want abundant life, overflowing life, 
deep life, weighty life, joyful life. We don't just want to survive, we want to thrive at every level of our human being. We were made for this. So let's look at President Reagan's words again in light of Jesus' words. These children over tenfold the number of Americans lost in all our nation's wars will never laugh, never sing, never experience the joy of human love. We can spend a lot of time talking about what this life to the full looks like, but I think President Reagan's words hint at it. I think for children, life to the full or an abundant life in part means lives full of laughter, of singing, of daily experiencing the joy of human love as God designed it. I think life to the full or an abundant life for a child would mean a life free from abuse and free from neglect. The question becomes, do all children who are born live such lives? I wish it were the case, but sadly when we look at today's world, I think if we're honest, we would say it simply isn't the case. There are more than 430,000 children in our nation's foster care system right now. Children enter foster care because they've experienced abuse, neglect, abandonment, often at the hands of the people they should most be able to trust in the world. More than 125,000 children in foster care are currently waiting for adoptive families. 125,000 children waiting for someone to call them out by name, to claim them, to accept familial responsibility for them, to love them, to care for them, and to remind them they're made in the image of God and they are therefore worthy of love and dignity. In Virginia, there are nearly 5,600 children in foster care right now, and about 1,800 of those children have a case plan of adoption. I don't have the stats for Massachusetts, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, who else? Was that? Oh, Alabama. Alabama, <laughs> right. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Uh, 5,600 in Virginia, right. The goals of foster care are permanency, safety, and well-being. As a society, this means that we want children to have permanent, loving families. We want them to grow up safe from further harm, and we want them to thrive. Not just survive, not just live, but to thrive. Sadly, Virginia has not done well in helping children in foster care achieve permanency, especially. Virginia typically ranks last or near to last in terms of permanency, meaning more kids age out of foster care percentage-wise without a permanent loving family than any, than any or all other states in a typical year. Nationally, about 20,000 children age out of foster care each year without a permanent loving family. Now, the flip side of that, we did have over 60,000 kids adopted from foster care last year, which was a record for the United States, so that, that is a positive trend. Children who age out of foster care without permanent loving families generally do not fare well in life. Few get college degrees, many struggle with homely, homelessness or addiction, many end up incarcerated, many are trafficked, many end up having children that enter foster care as well. As I mentioned before, children enter foster care for various reasons. Some of the reasons cited are neglect, abuse, drug and alcohol abuse on the part of their parents or caretakers, and even abandonment. The question is, how will we, the church, respond to these children? And related to that, how will we, we respond to those who've harmed them? I think if we're going to be a tru truly be a pro-life people, a, peer, a people who care about the dignity and quality of all human life, then foster care is an issue that we simply cannot ignore. Just to be clear, though, we don't engage the issues of abused and neglected children in order to answer critics from our culture. Rather, we engage these issues because we're followers of Jesus and because we want his precious children to experience the life he wants to bring to them. And we do it because we're called to do it. These are children who have not experienced life to the full as God intended. Their lives are not marked by abundance, by singing and laughing. They haven't experienced the joys of human parental love as God intended. God wants them to have a different life, and he wants to, to use us to help them find those lives. The question again then is how? How do we as followers of Jesus help these children and their families? How do we respond to the orphan crisis in our own backyard? You know, I can give you a hundred reasons not to foster or adopt a child from foster care, especially an older child, but it's funny, I can't support any of those reasons biblically. James 127 simply does not come with an asterisk. The body of Christ needs to not be okay with 125,000 kids waiting for adoptive families in the United States. We need to not be okay with 20,000 kids aging out of the foster care system each year without a family. Now there's a danger in saying that children in foster care are government's responsibility. I, I don't think you can support that biblically. Government has a vital role in this. Government is charged with protecting children from further harm, but it's woefully inadequate in its ability to help children heal from trauma. Government is not family. Churches have what these children need. We have families who can take them into our homes. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ who alone can heal them. Moreover, we have a calling from God to be his hands and feet to hurting children. 
The Bible has a lot to say about orphans or the fatherless. Now, most often we think of orphans as children who have lost both parents to death, but in today's world, death is not the only separator of children from their families. Abandonment separates children from their parents. Addictions, abuse, neglect often separate children from their parents when government intervenes in its protective role and removes them from unsafe situations. Those children removed from their parents by government agents are often placed into the foster care system. Many children in foster care will go back to their biological families. Many are legally freed from their biological families, though, and are in need of new, healthy, permanent families. Though not necessarily seen as orphans in the traditional sense, those children in the foster care system who have been separated from their parents because of abandonment, addiction, abuse, and or neglect are often left just as vulnerable as children who have lost their parents to death. I would say that it's important to remember that while not all are called to foster or adopt, everyone is called to care, and there's something that everyone can do. It's just a matter of finding out what God has called you uniquely to do. So if you believe that God is calling you and or your family and or your church to better, and love, to better love and care for orphans and vulnerable children in your community, there are definitive steps you can take. First, we need to see the crisis, and then as Christians, we need to meet this crisis as faithful followers of Jesus. Then we have to begin with prayer. We need to ask God to give us his eyes, his heart, for orphans. And we need to ask him how he wants to use us to meet their needs and to show them his love for them. We must remain sensitive to the Spirit's call in our lives. Next, we need to recognize our own brokenness. We need to re be reminded what Christ has done for us. Anything we do on behalf of orphans and vulnerable children must be done in response to what God has already done for us in our lives. Next, we need to have a good understanding of what God's heart for these kids and his expectations of us in relation to them. We need to see what scripture says, not only about God's heart for the fatherless, but about his design and plan for his creation. Now, we know in Genesis that God created. He created the world. He created plants. He created animals. He created people. And he looked at it and he called it what? He called it good. And it was good. People were intended to live in perfect relationship with God, with each other, with themselves, with nature. Lives to the full, you might say. I imagine there was a lot of laughter and a lot of singing in the garden. God designed children to be raised in a certain way. In his perfect plan, a child is born to a mother and a father who are joined together in the covenant of marriage. The child is loved by mom and dad as an image bearer of God. She is comforted, nurtured, held, cared for, provided for, and loved by her parents. When she receives proper parental care as God designed, her brain develops in, in a way that allows her to develop into a into a, a thriving adult whose relationships are marked by mutual love and trust. But sin entered, entered it into the world. Sin marred good, God's good creation temporarily. And as a result of sin, broken relationships came into the world. Broken relationships with God, with other people, with nature, with ourselves. And death also came into the world. Because of sin and its effects, many children have been deprived of the proper parental care that they were designed to have. Many children have been orphaned, separated from their parents, other classes of people have become marginalized as well. The Bible talks about three classes of vulnerable people a lot in the Old Testament. Who are they? And the foreigners. God had and has a heart for vulnerable people, and his heart is abundantly clear as you read scripture. God loves and defends the fatherless of the world. He claims them as his own. In Psalm 10, 14, it says, You are helper of the fatherless. You hear, O Lord, the desire of the afflicted. 17 and 18 says, "Defend the def uh, you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed in order that man who is of the earth may terrify no more. Deuteronomy 10, 18, it defend he defends the cause of the fatherless. Psalm 146, the Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow. Hosea 14, for in you the fatherless find compassion. And then Psalm 68, 5 and 6, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families, and I think that's a beautiful picture of adoption. God called a people to himself, Israel, and he told them that they were to be a blessing to the world. And part of his, uh, because of his love for the fatherless, he instituted special laws to Israel to ensure that the fatherless would have provision. And we see that in Deuteronomy 14 and Deuteronomy 24. God also made it clear that he wants his people to seek justice for orphans, to speak up for their rights. We see this in Deuteronomy 24, Psalm 82, where it says, Defend the cause of the weak and the fatherless, maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Isaiah 117, Learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless. And again in Jeremiah 7, 6 and 7. God issues stern warnings to those who mistreat orphans. We see this in Exodus 22, Deuteronomy 27, Proverbs 23, Isaiah 10, Malachi 3. 
God is so concerned with the fatherless that he defines pure religion in the context of caring for the fatherless. And of course, that's James 127. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, there are other places in Scripture that give us an indication of how to respond to these kids as well. They may not mention orphans or fatherless children explicitly, but we can draw from them as well. One of those is Jeremiah 29, 7, where God tells his people Israel to seek the peace and prosperity of the city in which they are exiled and to pray for it because if it prospered, they too would prosper. God wants his people to prosper and he wants cities to prosper. As I mentioned before, young adults who age out of foster care are vulnerable to trafficking, homelessness, repeating the child welfare cycle with their own children, incarceration, addiction, and more. So when we, the church, care for them properly, we address all of those societal issues and more. Matthew 25, we read about the sheep and the goats. God's sheep are those who care for the least of these among them. So loving the least of these is in our DNA as children of God. So the question is, are we doing that? Jesus told us in Luke 10 that we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. And then he tells the story, story of the Good Samaritan, which teaches us, among other things, that our neighbor is not necessarily someone we would normally associate with. Our neighbors are living with great pain in the foster care system right now. Our neighbors are biological children of parents who have abused and neglected those children that God loves so much. Jesus said we're loved to love them as well, the children and their families as ourselves. So when we interact with these children and their biological families, we're called to do so in such a way that affirms God's good design for them. Remember, God created humanity in his image. When we look into the eyes of these children and their families, we need to see them as image bearers and we need to treat them as such. Matthew 18 Jesus says that anyone who welcomes a child in his name welcomes Jesus himself. God is a God of reconciliation. Perhaps we're to be agents of reconciliation by helping a family get back on its feet and caring for a child until he or she is reunified with their biological families. And, of course, God is father to the fatherless. And as God's adopted children, we need to be about our father's business. In reading scripture, it's clear that God loves orphans and vulnerable children, and he wants his people to do the same. The call on Israel to be a blessing to the world is now a call on us, the church. We are to be a blessing to the world as well. In the years of the early church, there was a practice in pagan Rome called exposure. Has anybody heard about exposure? You've heard about it. Okay, so, so in exposure, many unwanted babies were abandoned by their parents for various reasons, and they were exposed to the elements, and they were left to die. The early Christian theologian, Tertullian, can anybody give me the correct pronunciation on it? Does anyone know? Tertullian? Is that a joke? Sounds good, right? Al Lemon, how's that? <laughs> so Tertullian reported that Christians would seek out the abandoned babies and raise them as their own or care for them until they died and then give them a decent burial. In fact, you can find in the catacombs tiny, tiny graves marked by the words adopted daughter and adopted son. The early Christians believed every person was created in the image of God and was therefore worthy of love and dignity, and they put that belief into practice. The early church, armed with the same scriptures we have today, answered God's clear call and cared for orphans no matter the cost. We have the same scriptures that the early church had, and we have the same call in our lives, we have the same Holy Spirit living within us, we serve the same God who is still Father to the fatherless. And yet we have 300,000 Christian churches in America, and we have 125,000 kids waiting for adoptive families. We have more than 10,000 Christian churches in Virginia, and we have 1,800 children with a case plan of adoption. How can this be? According to ethicsdaily.com, 38% of practicing Christians in the United States had seriously considered adoption, but 5% had actually adopted a child. Imagine how many fewer children would be waiting for adopted families if more than 5% had acted on that serious consideration. I believe it was Dennis Ramey who once said that the church in America was not ready for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. His point was that if abortion became illegal, there would be countless children in need of adoptive homes, and we, the church, would not be ready to adopt them. He was right. We know this because our response to the children already here and in need of adoptive families is woefully inadequate. If the church in America were properly aligned with God's will, God's heart, I believe that we have no children in foster care waiting for adoptive families. It would be a natural outflow of who we are as a God's adopted children. Now regarding adoption, I want to address what I call the elephant in the room, and that is that the, the word adoption has a certain stigma attached to it, even in this day and age. Frankly, the word makes some people uncomfortable, especially, to be honest, husbands whose wives have said that they're interested in adopting a child. The fact that an adoption is happening is evidence that something went wrong. And when we talk about adoption from foster care, that fact is even further magnified. 
A birth mom is not able to take care of her son or has abused her daughter. The children have been left alone at home, neglected for days on end. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Yet it's the reality for far too many children in this state and in our nation and in our world, so life hasn't gone well for a child and adoption becomes necessary. Then a lot of times there are automatic assumptions about the adoptive parents as well. Maybe they can't have children biologically because of infertility or age, or they're grieving the loss of a child. We've all thought about it when meeting adoptive families, and so it's understandable when people speak about adoption in hushed tones so that no one hears. But as Christians, I think we need to look at adoption differently. We need to see it in light of the gospel. But how do we do that? I want to ask a question. How many people in this room were adopted? Just raise your hands. Okay, no one. I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 1, okay. verses 4 and 5. You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his, son, as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So I ask the question again. How many people in this room were adopted? Okay. So God created adoption, and that's how he brings us into his family. And we celebrate our adoption through Christ, then how can we, his adopted children, attach a stigma to the word? How can we dwell on the negative? God doesn't leave us wallowing in our orphanhood brought on by our own sin. He brings us out of it, he cleanses us, he forgives us, and he makes us his children. Just as we celebrate our spiritual adoption, we must celebrate our adoption of children as a picture of God's redemptive work in the world. Now, in addition to the seven children that we adopted, we also fostered several children over the years. Not as many as you, though. You said 40? Yeah. That's crazy, and that's awesome. Short term. Well, still. <laughs> uh, some, of our some of the children we fostered went on to other families, and some went back to their biological families. It's not always easy to love a child and then lose that child. It'll be easy to try to guard our hearts against that pain, but as followers of Jesus, we're called to love. Whether that child is in our home for a day, or joins our family for a lifetime. Foster parenting is hard, but it's a calling just as adoption is. So after prayer and gaining an understanding of God's heart, we need to become educated and equipped. Children who've experienced trauma often bring that trauma into their relationships. If you engage these children in their families, you'll likely experience behaviors that confuse and confound you. Learn as much as you can about trauma and its effects, as well as how you might respond to that trauma in such a way that helps a child heal. Next, connect. Connect with others who are engaged in this ministry and learn about ways you and your family might join this world in a way that's collaborative. Next, share with others in your circles God's heart for these children and his expectations of his people to meet their needs. Do a small group study on a, on a book related to this issue. The goal is to educate people on what God's word says and then connect scripture to the needs of children in, in your community. As you raise awareness, continually pray that the Holy Spirit will open people's hearts to these children. Next, have some water and recognize that not everyone needs to foster or adopt, but everyone can do something. So some of the ways that you and your family can serve. Yes, you can adopt, you can foster, you can do Safe Families. Safe Families is a great program. It's rolled out in about 40 states, uh, whereby a, a mother in crisis can voluntarily place her children with families. A Safe Family is done through churches, and then she can get those kids back at any time. But, but the, the, the children are hosted. The idea is for the church to wrap around the family and wrap around the mom as well until she gets on her feet and gets the kids back. Nationally, I think they've had over 40,000 hostings since the program began about 15 years ago in Chicago. Mentor. A lot of these kids need, uh, need mentors. They need tutors. Uh, the families themselves need wraparound support. We had a family in our church that every couple of weeks they would just bring us a Target gift card to go buy diapers. And, and it was just such a blessing to know that they were in this with us. They eventually ended up taking in and adopting two kids themselves. Um, so there are plenty of ways to, to, uh, to, to wrap around meals. I mean, you know, when you, when you have ch children biologically, you generally have several months to prepare, right? So you got the Tupperware and you got frozen meals and all that stuff in the freezer. We sometimes have an out, how many, you know, you, you can have a call to take in a kid that afternoon. You know, we, sibling set. You know, we, we, um, we would get two hours notice sometimes. And so when well, our church in California used to do meal trains for families that took in kids from foster care. And we would just do meal every other night for about six weeks just to help them out. Even when the kids leave, we didn't tell people so we could keep getting free food. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Pray. Uh, you know, prayer is absolutely necessary. I mean, we, we are in the trenches. When you're taking in these kids and these kids have experienced trauma and you're dealing with a, a foster care system, an agency, you're dealing with social workers, you're dealing with therapists, you're dealing with ADHD and PTSD and you're dealing with, with RAD and you're dealing with uh, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and you're dealing with all this stuff, you need prayer. 
you know, because it can wear on you. And so pray for families, pray for kids, pray for uh, their biological, their foster and adoptive families. Become a CASA. Do, I don't know if you're familiar with the CASA program. The CASA program is a great program uh, where you can uh, become a voice for kids in court. Uh, sometimes kids are assigned attorneys in the, in, when, they have, when, they're, when they're in foster care, but, um, but a CASA is a court-appointed special advocate that gets to know the kids and make a recommendation based on the kids' best interest to the court. Depending on where you are, a CASA can have a lot of clout. My wife worked as a CASA in uh, Chesterfield County, and the judge really listens to uh, their recommendations down there. Uh, so those are some of the ways that you can serve as a family or individually. Some of the ways your church can serve children and families in the foster care system. One, become trauma-informed. You know, they, they we're talking about trauma all the time now, but it's amazing how oftentimes in America, you know, especially in our education system, you know, you got that kid in the corner who's always, you know, creating havoc and everything. You know, and the system, I mean, the, the education system, generally speaking, has dismissed that child as a problem child, right? They try to isolate that child without actually knowing that there's a reason that child is behaving the way they are. You know, when, when God designed kids to be raised a certain way and then they're not raised that way, it's going to affect the child's brain and they're going to behave and they're going to re react to things in ways that are unexpected. That kid is crying out for help and you're just dismissing that child, not you, the teachers, you know, just dismissing that child. Get to know the child, become trauma-informed. We had, um, there's a great, uh, conference called Empowered to Connect. Some of you may be familiar with it. That would, uh, Dr. Karen Purvis's uh, materials are used for the, for the basis for those, those conferences. And these, these are conferences designed for foster and adoptive parents to, um, to learn how to connect with these kids who have attachment issues. And so there was a, I talked to an adoptive mom in the Richmond area, and there was a church hosting one of these simulcasts for the Empowered to Connect conference. She had to leave halfway through because the child care workers couldn't deal with her kids. So wouldn't it be cool if the child care workers had been trauma-informed they can deal with their kids so she can actually, right? But that's another story. So become trauma-informed. Pray as a church. I mean, we, you know, there, there used to be something called the, uh, the National Foster Care Prayer Vigil. And, and, uh, but you can do that. You can do a prayer vigil for kids in foster care and for families as well. And there are actually prayer guides that can help you know how to, how to pray. Meal trains, I mentioned before, wrap around. You can host meetings and training sessions for local foster agencies, the, the county system, host recruiting events. Uh, Focus on the Family does uh, these adoption conferences across the country. Um, I speak at those, and so uh, you know, I'm a little plug for those. But uh, if you're gonna, um, you could actually host one of those if your church is large enough, and, and you know, bring the community together and help recruit foster care and adopted families. Preach on God's heart for the orphan. There's several months that are great. April is National Child Abuse Month. May is Foster Care Month, and November is Adoption Month. It's also November. It's also Orphan Sunday, and so you can do an Orphan Sunday event. Yep. Yeah, y'all did one. That's right. Um, connect with local bridge organizations. Bridge organizations are Christian organizations that connect church and state, or church and county. And there are bridge organizations all over the country that are that are working to do just that. You could adopt a local foster care agency where you actually build relationships with the people at the foster agencies and just say, hey, can you bring us your needs and we'll help meet those needs. We have four churches. In, in the Richmond area, in Henrico County, that regularly meet with Henrico County officials. Now, the, the Henrico County officials are not necessarily Christian, but they're absolutely blown away that these four Christian churches are coming to them and saying, hey, we want to meet your needs. And they said it's been hu a huge blessing. And now they actually can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but they actually think they're going to eventually have enough families for all their kids. So it's been a huge blessing to them. Uh, celebrate adoptions just as you do births. Become a safe families church. Create an adoption fund. Do showers for adopted families. Uh, Again, you know, some of the things you do for biological families, you can do for foster and adoptive families too. Clothing and supplies closets, parents' nights out. Uh, you could start a foster care ministry. You could do a serve day to a foster and adoptive family. We had uh, a lot of our home maintenance was kind of uh, taking a back seat to caring for these kids. And so we had a team come out and just fix stuff around the house. And it was great because I can't fix anything anyway. So uh, yeah, host a Christmas party. Uh, and then maintain resources for your congregation. There are phenomenal resources out there. Russell Moore's book, Adopted for Life, is great. Um, CAPO, the, the president of CAPO actually goes to this church. Uh, CAPO had, is the Christian Alliance for Orphans, and they have phenomenal uh, resources for people. Wonderful blogs and books out there, too, and conferences. Um, I, I would advise you to be careful if you start reading blogs, because um, understand that sometimes you find the angry person who wants to get something off their chest. So, so. Get, get a, a recommendation from someone who knows before you just start reading someone's blog uh, because there are some really good ones. Jason Johnson is a phenomenal blogger. So if you just write his name down, some of you might be familiar with him. 
Um, read his stuff. It's really good stuff. And then be prepared. As you step up and answer God's call to care for and love orphans and vulnerable children, recognize that you're engaged in nothing less than spiritual warfare, and therefore you can't expect attacks. Lastly, give God the glory. Without him, we'll have little impact on these children's lives. With him, children's lives will be transformed by the gospel, as will the lives of generations to come. So the question is, are our churches and families routinely welcoming orphans, inviting them in, sharing God's love with them, helping them find safety and permanency and a place to heal from whatever pain and loss they've experienced? If yes, then praise God for what he's doing through your church on behalf of orphans. Perhaps God wants you to share your passion and expertise with other churches who might share your concern for orphans but are not yet serving them actively. If your church is not actively engaged in caring for orphans, would you prayerfully consider how God might want you to get involved? God's love for orphans is abundantly clear in Scripture and as, and his, as, his, expect, as is his expectation of his people to provide for them, to speak up for them, and to seek justice for them. And as we think about what it means to be pro-life, let's not only remember the children who have been deprived of it, but let's remember the children who have been given life but are not experiencing the life that Jesus came to bring them. If we're going to be pro-life, we need to be pro-adoption. We need to care about children in foster care. We need to care about family reunification. We need to care about children in orphanages overseas. We need to help all children live lives marked by singing, by laughter, and lives in which they experience the joys of human love. And that's it for my notes, and we have time for questions now. Oh, wait, you were going to be first. Yeah, that's right. You were going to remind me yes. that I supposed yes. to ask her first. Yes, my parents. Okay, my parents have been absolutely phenomenal. So, but I think part of that uh, was because I grew up with four cousins who were adopted. So that's part of my story, is that um, on my dad's side of the family, uh, he, had, he had three siblings, and each one of them had two kids. So two of those siblings could not have biological, couldn't have biological kids, so they each adopted two kids. So growing up, I had four cousins that were adopted. It was completely normal. I never thought of them as my adopted cousins, and these were my real cousins. It wasn't like that at all. They were, they were my cousins. And so it was very normal for us growing up. Plus, my dad came from a family that uh, he was he was actually the, um, so his his father had been married before, so he had, and then uh, his wife died, and so he had three kids. So my dad had some half-siblings, and then my dad and, uh, my dad was the only child of that union, but then his, his father died, and then his mother remarried a man who had children, so then she had, so then he had step-siblings. So this kind of blended family thing was normal for him too, and so when we started fostering and adopting, they embraced our kids, and, and my mother-in-law did too, and so it's been phenomenal to see them just come alongside them and just, I mean, these are not, it's not like, well, these are real grandchildren, these are adopted grandchildren, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, and they probably have biological grandchildren, my parents have two, yeah. yeah through my so brother. They yeah. Um, I just will make a quick comment um, because you mentioned the medicine. So, Rachel, Jed's wife, has started, maybe this others, I'm not sure, I'm recently familiar with it, but um, they're, we're trying to get an adoption foster support group. Mm -hmm. So, it's going, actually, we're meeting this Sunday, I think, for the second time. Um, I think Rachel's view is more like supporting adopted foster parents in the church now. My heart is more the advocacy, right. and, you know, the challenging the church, some of the statistics, um, which is what we tried to talk to a little bit with this year's work on Sunday. I don't know if next year's will, you know, my heart would be that it's a full-fledged Orphan Sunday. You can have a whole service dedicated to Orphan Stand, Stand uh, representing the foster part of, of the whole movement. Yeah. So we'll see, um, you know, I know Sam, um, but, you know, they have a lot of pressure on how they their Sundays, sure. which Sundays can be dedicated for what if they even do that, right. and the calendar, the Anglican calendar, and all that stuff. So there's always a lot of competition for the time. Right. But my hope is um, because the Metafeds are here and Sam is our new rector, a young single guy, um, <laughs> my hope is that, you know, I, I would love to see, you probably know the story, there's a, there's a church in Florida who um, embraced the challenge so much. That yeah. they emptied their foster care yeah. system that, that, in the county, right? Well, uh, they, yeah. they're called, it's for kids of South Florida, and it's actually probably the most comprehensive church based foster care adoption ministry in the country. It's phenomenal. What's the what they're doing. It's yeah. called Four yeah. Kids of South Florida. Four Kids Numeral Four Kids of South Florida. It's, okay. it's uh, based in Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. And uh, 
Tom McCassick runs it, and Emmy is just ridiculous. Uh, What's the name of the guy who runs it? Sorry? What's the name of the guy who runs it? Uh, Tom McCassick. Okay. If you email me, I can. Yeah, yeah sure. I'll, I'll send you a link. I mean, they, they do crazy good stuff down there. It's, it's, it's so good. It's so cool because that's like such a model of yeah. what the church can do. Right, because the statistics yeah. you're talking about, and even what Dennis Ring said, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of, well, you know, a lot to be done, and all the scriptural mandate. It's like, are we reading the same Bible? Like, what's, right. you know, and so to have that as a model. So for me to get some of those messages into Sam's here, you know, he may or may not embrace right. it, but why not? Particularly, we live in a state where it has the worst record of, you know, kids aging out. Know, we live in one of the most wealthy sure, areas. Sure. Oh, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. I mean, the potential yeah. I mean, is there. Well, you can give them other, other models to the call yeah. in, in Arkansas. It's Children of Arkansas Love for a Lifetime. It's a collaboration of churches in, the, in, in Arkansas, working okay. with counties. Um, Project 127 in, uh, in Colorado. Actually, so in, in Colorado, um, state and church started working together about 14 years ago. And Project 127 was the, one of the first ministries focused on the family has been part of it. And they reduced the number of waiting kids from over 800 to less than 300 in a few years. And so it can be done. And um, our church in California was a great example. So we were uh, we got to the point where, um, it, it's a Grace Brethren Church, and we got to the point where about 20% of the kids in Sunday school on Sunday morning were either in foster care or had been in foster care and were now adopted. And it became a movement. And we actually became known for that, our church did. And, and I don't know if anybody's ever watched the show A Home for the Holidays. It's on every year at Christmas, uh, about a week before Christmas. It's on CBS, and they show kids that have been that uh, the Dave Thomas Foundation helps put it on, and they show kids that have, uh, need to be adopted from foster care. But they also feature four families each year that have adopted from foster care, and they featured our family in 2012. Mm -hmm. And uh, but th when they heard our story, they s they heard about our church, and they said we got to get some of that. So they came down, and they here's a, a non-Christian CBS crew mm -hmm. coming to a Christian church, mm -hmm. filming part of the service interviewing our pastor, and so here's a Christian church being celebrated on national TV for, for caring for orphans. I mean, it's like, that's a God thing, <laughs> you know, and, and that's what can happen um, if you just, but, but see, a lot of people want to over-program things. I'm not a strong believer in over-programming things. I feel like a lot of times all the strategic planning and all that, and I, people want to gonna throw bananas at me now, but, or oranges or whatever. I mean, all this strategic planning, I feel like sometimes it short circuits the Holy Spirit. It's like he may want to go over here, and you're sitting there making all these plans over here, you know, little plans, and he's got huge plans, you know. And I think that a lot of times we just need to pray, be a voice. Proverbs 31 8 says, Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. And that was one of the verses that drove me at our church. And then get out of God's way and just let him do his thing, and he's going to change people's hearts. You know, we don't want to strong arm anybody into this. You know, we want to let. It's got to be the Holy Spirit bringing people to this. You know, we just have to be a voice. And so we saw it become a movement much bigger than it would have been if we had planned it, put it that way. So, yeah. But I think that education side of it, you know, just, just knowing the need and the call mm -hmm. and the gap, you know, that's, that's what you hope that maybe the Holy Spirit kind of. I'm sorry. About 10 minutes. About 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering, maybe they're going to be a 10 per second. Per second session. <laughs> it's okay. So, there's a camera here the whole time. <laughs> was it recording? No, I There's something there, isn't it? Yeah, it, well, he set up the camera, but I don't know. I don't. Somebody has to start. It might be recording. He, he knew what he was doing, I didn't. So, anyway. <laughs> John, you briefly touched on social services. Right. Uh, uh, if you could dig into that a little bit more. My, my uh, son and daughter in law uh, took two foster kids in uh, from birth, basically. I uh, had about nine months. And, their experience was really mixed. Prince William County. Uh, they, I Which is where? South. Uh, South. Manassas. Okay. Yeah. Um, a couple of folks with social services they really connected with. Uh, somebody who I think had more maybe clout, they didn't. And uh, uh, it really became tough. The birth mother was in Woodbridge and uh, uh, because of drug addiction and mental health, uh, it was state where I just said no, she can't uh, get the kids. Uh, um, my uh, son-in-law, or my daughter-in-law's son, developed a relationship with this girl, the birth mother, and really connected, and uh, um, but they ended up placing the kids with a, a distant relative in Knoxville, mm -hmm. Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, they, they just 
really had problems with social services. Uh, yeah. a, a bit of it's probably because uh, I have a pretty strong little daughter in law, but uh, uh, I don't know any thoughts on that. Turn the camera services. off. <laughs> no, no, look, I mean, a lot of, okay, so this is one of the things that bothers me about a lot of Christians that get involved with this, is, is a lot of Christians who become involved in foster care adoption, I'm not saying, but you're, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just yeah. saying, yeah. I'm prefacing what I'm going to say, have this attitude, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and those kids are Caesar's, and I'm like, wait a second, those kids aren't Caesar's, <laughs> you know, Caesar is called to protect those kids, you know, Caesar being God, you know, and, and, um, but, but God is father to the father. And so we need to see, if we see injustice, I mean, I, I read some of the script, we're called to speak up against injustice. There are some phenomenal social workers, okay? There are others that aren't so phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It's just like every area of life. Although there are two areas that I want everybody to be perfect in, that's doctors and pilots. I want them to be perfect <laughs> at what they do. You know, everybody else can have some grace, but I really don't want my pilot to be a goof, you know? So anyway, um, that's just a little aside. But it's true, don't, don't you really want your pilot to be perfect. Yeah. Anybody else could be eighty percent, but a lot of social workers. So, so they get into it maybe for whatever reasons. There are social workers that are working out their own childhood trauma by becoming a social worker and helping kids, but they haven't dealt with that trauma well, and so they may have a bias. There are social workers that have an extremely strong bias toward reunifying every child in foster care. Every child needs to be with their biological family. Well, they need to talk to my seven kids because some of them don't want anything to do with their biological family, even though we've encouraged them to have relations. I have to tell my nineteen-year-old to call her father back. You know, and, and so so she has she doesn't she doesn't want to have a relationship with him, and that's okay. I'm not going to, but but to have this bias, this belief that every child needs to be with their biological family, no matter how remote. Let's send them to Tennessee instead of having them live. Because the thing is that children, after they're in a home for a certain amount of time, they become the, the people caring for them become their psychological parent. So blood doesn't matter as much as the, the bond, the heart bond, at that point. So I believe, and a lot of people in social work believe this too, that you need to look at the attachment before you sever. You've got to have a very good reason to sever that attachment. And the fact that they've got, they share, you know, one eighth blood with these people in Tennessee, yeah, you're going to damage them by moving them out of this home that they where they're bonded. And so, it. So, I mean, we dealt with social workers who had extremely strong biological family biases in LA County. Some didn't, you know, and and. Um, and so I would just say that uh, that there's a lot of bad, there's a lot of good. You know, we we have to. I guess my feeling is that that there were times where we spoke up on behalf of our kids, and we made enemies in social services. But we also believe that we answer to God, not them. You know, yes, we are so. You know, we are foster parents under their system, but we at the, at the end of the day, we're followers of Jesus Christ first, and His Word says to speak up for justice, and 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 that went both ways. I mean, there was a time that we had a little boy that was in our home, and he was placed at, uh, at, right out of the hospital with us. And so, and we fell in love with this kid. I mean, this kid was I mean, the cutest kid ever. You know, this kid was amazing, and, and he, was, he just had a great little personality, and we had him for, uh, but his biological grandparents were in Colorado, and so they were seeking custody, but they came forward at his birth. They didn't wait, you know, they, they came forward at birth. And so they did everything they were supposed to do, but there's something called the ICPC, Interstate Interstate Compact, uh, and so um, Interstate Child Placement Compact. And so the paperwork takes a while, and so social services in LA County would tell them, you better just move to California if you ever want your grandson. It's going to take 11 months for the paperwork, and by then the judge is going to terminate your daughter's rights, and he's going to be placed for adoption, so you don't have a chance and all this kind of stuff. And, and we said, well, that's not right. You know, I mean, they, they, they've done everything they're supposed to do. And by the way, his biological mother, so she was homeless, doing drugs, and it's easy to vilify her until you hear her story. And, and again, this is where we all, we, everybody is deserving of love and dignity. She was a, a, a U.S. war veteran in Afghanistan, and she was wounded, and she got addicted to painkillers, and one thing led to another, and she ended up homeless on drugs. And so, really, she, you know, she's the enemy. She's the bad guy here, you know? And so, anyway, we, we, um, we went to the system and said, it's wrong. You've got to speed this up. These grandparents have done nothing wrong. Selfishly, it would have been great to adopt this kid. We, we love this kid, you know. But, but we also felt like what's right for him is to go to his biological grandparents. They were Christians. They had done everything right. And, um, and so we fought LA County for them to get him sooner. And, and um, fortunately, because of our advocacy over the years, they knew us at headquarters and they moved, you know. And, and um, I had one really strong ally there who was a Christian and she, 
she saw that um, you know she would she would make things right a lot of times when I would come to her with these things, and so um, we eventually were able to get him placed with his grandparents earlier. It was seven months instead of eleven, and actually Colorado was the one that was slow; it wasn't LA County. And then um, it's interesting though because we we then talked to the social worker and said, okay, what's the transition going to be? Or, you know, and she said, well. We'll probably just, I'll probably, you know, either I or one of my coworkers will just take them on a plane and hand them off to the grandparents. It's like, really? Is that, that's not, that's not a good, that's not a child friendly transition plan right? because you're going to hand them to complete strangers, you know? And so we said, why don't you take some funds and bring the grandparents here for a few days so he can get to know them or send one of us there with him, you know? And, and so that we can, he can be with someone he loves and is familiar with and comfortable with while he gets to know them. Oh, we just can't do that. So we took it upon ourselves and the grandparents, and we got a family from our church to host them. And so the grandparents and the, and the mother came from Colorado at their own expense, stayed with our friends for several days, and spent you know 16 hours a day with them, so he could get familiar with them, know their voices, know their smells, know what they felt like when they held them and stuff. And, and so that was the, that ended up being a transition. Mm -hmm. uh, it was cool. I visited him about a year and a half later. And I think he's still recognized. I mean, he came out, he was very comfortable, and he got up. And so we're actually his godparents now. They said if anything ever happens to them, we'd like for, you know, they'd like for us to adopt them. So anyway, it was, uh, all I have to say is uh, you got to speak up for the right, for the kid's best interest. We have to. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. We can turn the camera back on now. <laughs> I think part of what you're talking about, too, part of the delicate balance is You've got situations where kids are reunified and it goes very badly. Right. You've got situations where kids are not unified and it goes very well. I mean, they're all over the place. Sure. And so no one can predict the future. They, they make these decisions based, and I'm not saying they're always right, but you know, I, how many articles have I read about these kids that go back to their biological families and end up dead? I mean, right. horrible, you know, or continue being abused. Or, I mean, there, there's some. Or maybe there's times where they should have gone back right. and they didn't. You well, know, that's I mean, the thing too. You know, we can't we can't push for yeah. one. Yeah, every child, every situation is different, and we have to look at what is that ch in that child's best interest. Um, we have had situations. I mean, we had a little girl that stayed with us for a while. It became very, very clear that, that somebody had made false allegations against her mom. Yeah, these were loving parents. They were wonderful, and so we pushed for reunification in that situation. You know, and so. So again, every I mean, God is a God of reconciliation. He wants you know He wants to see families come back together, and that's something we can all celebrate. But if Mom doesn't get back on her feet, we can't let this kid languish in foster care forever, you know. And then and then send the kid to Knoxville, you know, to these. I mean, it's, that's not. I, I don't think that's healthy for kids. I think it's healthy for kids to uh, to come into foster care and either stay in that home, you know, or go back to the people who but do it in a timely fashion. You know, don't don't let a kid sit there in foster care for four years and then you define it. That's not okay for a kid. Uh, child is I think that we as Christians and as churches need to come up with creative ways of helping to support those who want to adopt. Um, come up with the funds to do so because not every church and every individual family throughout the U.S. is affluent. Right. Um, and this is a fairly affluent area. There are churches in Anglicanism that are affluent, but not every church is. And there are some that are very small, uh, some churches that are very small, and they don't have the funds. Um, the, the, church, the families in those churches don't necessarily have the funds to be able to support adoption. I will so, say that adoption from foster care, though, is essentially free. Is it? The expense of adoption, unless you get involved in a custody battle, the, the expense of adoptions are private adoption and international adoption. But adoption from foster care generally costs almost nothing. Because the state okay. so wants the these kids to adopt. So the not? Like in LA County, there was a, there was a uh, so there was a, like a $400 legal fee from the, the guy who actually did the adoption, and the county reimbursed that money. I mean, they reimbursed four hundred dollars because they knew what he charged, basic, or he charged what they reimbursed, and so. Um, but we got involved in a, in a legal battle for our sons and had to hire an attorney, and that cost. We ended up spending a lot of money for that. But generally, but that's because we were in a custody battle. Um, but generally speaking, adoption from foster care is, is, is very minimal cost. So, but but you're right. As far as international foster care adoption, that that's can well, be very. I mean, international and private can be very expensive. Show up. Show up. And the, yeah, there are organizations out there that do grants. And, and they have, 
why you find us um, and revival adoption. They create scholarship. Well, they have funds, funds and grants and to pay to help people pay for their adoptions. Is that national? Well, yeah, yeah, and, and I can get you in touch with some of those too. Show up. And, and there's, there's ministries like the ABBA Fund that will and um, Life Song for Orphans who will have actually help the churches start adoption funds, and then they'll run the funds. They'll do the administrative work. There was a question over here. I think. Are oh, you having? Yeah, just uh, John, is there you, you have a resource that like you mentioned uh, Safe Families Foster Care. Uh, Mentoring programs, possible. Is there a clearinghouse? Is there a website that makes available those resources for a local church that you know? Um, there are in different. Okay, so CAFO is kind of the umbrella organization. CAFO, C A F O dot org, Christian Alliance, Christian Alliance for Orphans. So they have a ton. Of, they have a wealth of information yeah. on there, and a lot of times you can find bridge organizations in your specific area. So where in Massachusetts are you? Well, this is a new report that the in where? Newbury Court, Massachusetts. Okay. So if you, um, I mean, you can go on there and find out some of the things that, you know, some of the groups that are in your area. So, because like, um, CASA is not necessarily going to be in every place. Uh, Safe Families is, I think, in 40 states so far. Uh, but but then, then also, we'll, you know, you can start getting involved in that network and then people will, can, there's a great, there, there are a couple, there's one really phenomenal foster care, for David Arudin, he, he's in, I think he's in Massachusetts, and he's a fantastic resource up in that area. So, uh, if you get in touch with me, I can show you how to get in touch with him. You had a question? Yes, um, two questions actually. I know that for people that are, have gone through this, there's that like fire of oh, I want to inspire others, I want others. But I think so many people feel so overwhelmed by it. They feel like I can't even take care of my own kids, my own family. Like I'm just right. way, I don't have the mental or emotional capacity, right. and then. They feel judged because they don't have mental or emotional capacity, and then it's almost like a division. It right. just it gets very overwhelming. So, what would you say? But I would say to that is none of us have the capacity to deal with this stuff. I mean, I, I if you if you told me what I was going to face with seven kids before I took in the first, I wouldn't have done it probably because I I would have felt woefully <laughs> inadequate to do this. But I think that that you find I mean God equips you as you go along, you know, and and um, and then. You surround yourself with the support that you need. Um, there's never, I think a lot of people who opt out are kind of people who are looking for an excuse anyway, rather than prayerfully asking God, would you have us do this? You know, I mean, that's one thing. I don't want everybody to foster and adopt. I want everybody to ask God if that's what, they, what, he, what, he, what he's calling them to do. I would love to see all premarital counselors because I hear a lot of times where one spouse feels called to do it and the other spouse doesn't. Well, would have been cool if they had talked about this before they got married, you know, and that didn't cause a lot of tension in a marriage. I've seen it. And so um, I think that if every Christian said, okay, God, we know what your word says about orphans, how would you have me care for orphans? And then just do what the Holy Spirit leads them to do. And there's no guilt, no judgment, no condemnation, no nothing. You're just doing what God called you to do. Um, and a better question to ask is if you're not called. Ask if you're not called. Right. Well, no, I think we're, I think <laughs> the difference. We're called to care. Yeah. What that means, who knows? You know. I mean, it you're doesn't not, mean we all call. We're all called to take kids into our home for yeah. sure. You know, I know a lot of people. I probably shouldn't be taking kids. I probably shouldn't. You know, but for whatever reason, I did. But you're not saying you wouldn't repeat it. With you. No, what I'm saying is, if I, I, I would have felt, I wouldn't have felt as confident yeah. going in but because you, you I would still do it. If I had seen. Yeah. Well, if I'd seen the big picture of how God continued to provide resources, then absolutely, because yes. because we've developed a trust in God because we've seen Him work. Mm -hmm. We've yeah. seen Him show up so many times. I mean, He's worked miracle after miracle in our kids' lives and other. It, it, that I wouldn't have missed that for anything, you know. Yeah. Um. Yeah, no, right. Same kind of general theme is the whole adoption process. Like, yeah. I know families that really want biological children and more of. A about like you know even the catholic church that's done great work in adoption and foster care but they would say you know it's not moral to not have your own biological children if you can type of thing so what are the thoughts and thinking around this mutual I, called both or I, I just don't agree i mean i don't i wouldn't agree with that you know i mean i'm not i'm not a pastor and i can't you know i didn't go but i i, I don't know how you can say it's not i mean Caring for orphans, I, you know, it's, I mean, you, kids are, you know, kids are a gift from God. You know, kids are a blessing. Kids, are, you know, and kids need to, the kids that don't have proper parental care. The church needs to be it. That does that mean that nobody should have biological children? Absolutely not. You know, but I mean, I think everybody needs to ask the question, God, how do you want to build my family? And how, you know, how, how can we most honor you as a family? You know, and so 
I love seeing families that do both, but, but you know, if family does one or the other, as long as they're being faithful to what God has called them to do, then I think that, I mean, that, that's the safest place to be. That. I feel like a lot of people feel like they can't discern that. Like they're, right. you know, waiting for the big voice from heaven or prophetic dream, and that happens sometimes, but not always. Right. That's a bigger question. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I mean, I can't answer that in, like, one or two minutes. You know, I mean, for, for us, we just knew. You know, it's something that the Holy Spirit laid on our hearts and laid it on both. He laid it on both of our hearts, and we just knew. It was never a big revelation. He didn't, you know, like, I get it. You know, like. But you shared when you realized, because I was being personal, saying, you know, can't because I had that. And he shared that when they realized what the great need was. Yeah, well, so, so we were going to have two biologicals. So that, mm -hmm. that, that, that is good. So we were, we were going to have, the, the joke about my eyebrows was a joke, but the plan of having two biological right, right. adopt two was the original plan. We right. took in the two boys, we adopted them, we felt like, okay, we're done with this. It was such a, it, it was a, a, talk about like corrupt social workers, it was yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> and so we were done, but we also believed that, that God had called, God had brought us through that, not just so that we could have these two kids, so that, so that we could continue to be a voice for others, be a, be a, a support to others, be a voice to the church and then we realize you know what there's a huge need out there and, and so that, the Holy Spirit kind of used the need to impress upon us keep adopting and the next one we adopted was one that was on paper unadoptable so it was like God led us to go okay let's find that kid that no one else is looking for you know and so um, we got we, a 12 year old in a group home you know mm -hmm. the system had given up on her finding an adoptive family uh, and, uh, and yeah. you know we took her in and, um, and, and let me just tell you one quick story about her. This is one of the most insightful. Yeah, you know, I talked in here about uh, we need to recognize our own bro brokenness. She made a statement one time to me that was the most insightful statement that I think I've ever heard anybody make, um, as far as, uh, yeah, so, so she was about 13 or 14. She had been in a bunch of homes before ours, group homes. She was in a uh, uh, juvenile detention center. She, her life had been wrecked. I'm not going to tell you why she went into foster care, but trust me, it was bad. And so we take her into our home, and um, one day she and I go over in our van to pick up my two sons from track practice. When they were in middle school at the time. And we're sitting in the van, and um, Ashley had been in foster care since the age of nine, by the way. And so, uh, so anyway, this dad wheels his son in the wheelchair in front of us, and, and it's very quiet, and he just wheels his, his son, and, and obviously had emotional, mental, physical, all kinds of issues. He was just a vegetable in a chair, basically. His life was, there was nothing, you know, his son, this dad wheels yeah. his son out. And I'm, Ashley and I are watching this, and remember, she's 13 or 14 at the time. So we're watching this, and I'm seeing this dad from a position of maybe sympathy, you know, or kind of like, wow, I don't know if I can do what this dad is doing, you know, that would be really hard, you know, kind of that standpoint. And she breaks the silence and she said, a lot of kids make fun of kids like that. That's the first thing she said. And I said, well, I hope you don't make fun of, fun of kids like that. And she said, Dad, why would I make fun of someone who's just like me? Exactly. And I'm like, she's coming from a position of intimacy. She's She recognizes, she's not, physically she's fine. She's recognizing that she's just as broken as I can in the chair. And that's an instant.